All right, uh, welcome back. This is our final installment of our short supplemental series on thermal management in mechanical and electric systems, electronic systems. Uh, the lectures one and two discussed the design of heat sinks for microprocessors and other portable electronic systems. This lecture is going to cover frictional heating in brakes, uh, specifically uh, brake pads. So let's quickly talk about a disc brake assembly. So what we have here is uh, a rotating disc that is connected to the axle and is passing through an open pair of calipers shown here in red. Now these calipers are outfitted, outfitted with brake pads usually some kind of a rigid molded as asbestos material. And when the driver presses down on the brake pedal, the calipers are actuated and the pads are pressed up against the rotating disc. So these here kind of clamp down on that disc. And that's going to slow the rotation you know, via friction. And uh, that's going to convert that kinetic energy into heat and, you know, as such, those brake pads need to be chosen, the material needs to be chosen such that it has very advantageous frictional and thermal properties because we don't want it to melt, we don't want it to uh, give up prematurely. So, let's discuss something of an idealized uh, brake assembly here where we have just a rotating disc and a couple annular sections, one on either side, that represent our brake pads. Okay, um, the disc radius is going to be given by capital R, and the two annular sections have an inner and outer radius given by uh, Ri and Ro, respectively. And these pads are going to be pressed up against this rotating disc with some force given by F, you know, on both sides, obviously. And if that, that F, obviously, times the area is going to be the pressure at which those are pressed up against the brake, or the disc, rather. Ultimately, we want to determine the maximum pressure uh, the pads can take, and that's the pressure that we're going to hope to be applying every time we hit the brake. Okay. So how is the heat generated? Uh, forgive this animation, but uh, as the car is moving, it has some kinetic energy. Uh, so we're just going to say that's one half m mass of the car times the velocity squared. Now, as it's moving and we stop, all of that kinetic energy is going to be converted, we're going to say in this idealized case, to heat in the brake pads. So that's going to give us a measure of, if we know the final and initial velocity, we can determine the amount of heat generated based on the uh, based on the C sub P's of both the materials in the pad and the disk. All right, so first we want to go through a quick derivation of frictional heating. This is not covered particularly well in Shigley. So I wanted to make sure to go through this pretty well. Here, what we're going to have is the same setup we had before. Up top here, we have our a brake pad that's uh, annular in shape with an inner and outer radius. And then here, we have our disk that is uh, of radius capital R or R3 in this picture, rather. Now, if we assume the vehicle is decelerated at a constant rate, that's going to do a couple things to make our analysis simpler. Uh, the biggest thing is that it's going to give us the amount of time that we're stomping on the brake, rather. So um, what we want to just remember here is that, oop, I want to use a different color. The time that it takes to break, we're going to say is equal to 
assuming that we have constant deceleration, that's going to be equal to the 2 times the break distance. Ooh, dang it. So the distance needed to come to a stop, dBr, over the initial velocity. So because the heating of these pads is a very transient process, we really need that value, and we're going to be using it in our analysis. Um, real quick, also, the velocity as a function of time is now just equal to, because it's decelerated at a constant rate, we have a uh, uh, very easy expression for v sub t and the rotational rate as a function of t. Um, and, of course, as a function of the break time. Okay, now if we consider a annular differential surface, so we want to find the amount of heat generated by the entire uh, pad. And so what we're going to do is we're going to consider an annular differential area shown here in gray. And that dA has an area of... Uh, phi naught, which and phi is the angle given by this uh, annulus, times r, which is the radial position of the uh, differential area, times dr, which is the thickness of the differential area. Okay, so if we have that, what we want to find is the differential amount of heat generated by the friction. And we're going to call that d e dot, the differential energy generation. That is going to be equal to the differential brake power that's generated. We're saying that all the power going into the brakes that's converting that kinetic energy is going straight to heat. Now, the brake power is equal to the velocity times the frictional force. So we can make that substitution here, where it's d velocity times frictional force f of little f. Now, what's good here is that, for one, we know that v is equal to r omega. Okay? And the other thing we need to realize is that at this differential area, at this dA, r is constant and omega is constant. You know, that's not changing at all. So we can take this entire portion out of the derivative. And if we do that, what we get, just go ahead and put it in here, is we'll go ahead and make that substitution, omega r, d frictional force. Okay. Now, the frictional force we know is equal to some, friction co some coefficient of friction times the normal force that's acting on the pad. So we can, and of course the frictional coefficient is constant, so we can take that out as well. We get r omega mu times d normal force. And what's the normal force? Well, the normal force is the pressure on the pad times the area over which it's acting. So this just equals to r omega mu pressure dA. And now we have an expression for the differential heat generation. Oop. And oh, of course, we make this substitution here for dA being equal to phi naught r dr, and we get this final expression down here. 
Great. Now we can integrate that to get the total uh, heat generation. So now we want to talk about the pressure that's being acted or that's being exerted on the disk by the pad. So there's two basic assumptions. One is the uniform pressure assumption, and you know, that's just what it sounds like. It's saying that everywhere on this pad, the pressure is equal. So that's just P equals P max. Because remember, we want to be at the maximum pressure all the time. And as it turns out, this is a pretty decent assumption for beginning of life brakes. So if you've just put on new brake pads, this is going to get you closer in your um, thermal analysis. However, what's more commonly used uh, and what's more accurate once the brakes are a little bit broken in is the uniform wear assumption. And the easiest way to think about this is that so the force, so let's consider all th these differential areas right here. So here's one differential area, and here's another differential area. So the force acting on both of these differential areas is equal. However, the area is not equal. So the pressure acting on each of those differential areas is different, or it's coming from each of those differential areas is different. And so what we get with the uniform wear assumption is that pressure is a function of radial position. And it's a pretty easy uh, equation. You can de derive it from that. And that's just saying that PR is equal to P max times R2, where R2 is your inner radius right here divided by your radial position r okay now we're going to go ahead and use the uniform wear assumption because that's most common and if we do that plug in this expression for p on the previous differential equation we derived we get this expression where the differential heat generation as a function of R and T is equal to omega naught mu P max uh, inner radius times phi, all times 1 minus T over T break times R dr. And again, this can be integrated to get the final uh, heat generation for the pattern. So again, uh, this is a much more in-depth analysis than what's in your book. Uh, what's recommended, what a, you know, an easier approach would be just to say that all of the kinetic energy in the car is converted to heat in the brakes and just go from there. Um, that is going to get you pretty close, but if you wanted to do something rigorous, this would be the method you'd use. So let's go ahead and do a quick example. Um, for me, I've made the trip up to Jacksonville from Gainesville a number of times, and there's no real good way to do it. Uh, the most direct route takes you right through Waldo, Florida. And anyone who's driven through Waldo knows that there are a million uh, speed changes throughout the city, especially when you are on the outskirts coming in. And you, you know, you're driving along at around 65 miles per hour, and then, you know, in quick succession, you break down to 55, 45, 35, 25, and then there's a stoplight almost immediately when you enter the city. So you end up, you know, you end up using your brakes a lot. And you really want to make sure you're doing it because this town also happens to be something of a speed trap, somewhat infamous. So let's consider the difference between going 65 and coming to a stop versus uh, going 65 and stepping down by 10 miles per hour every 1,000 feet and see what that does to your brakes. You know, maybe while you may not be happy, maybe your brakes are. So the way we're going to look at this is we're going to say, okay, there's 1,000 feet between speed limits changes, 
and we are going to start applying the brakes 100 feet before we get to the sign. And we're going to start at 65 miles per hour and we're going to step down as shown. And we want to, so what we're going to have is we're going to have brake heating while we're stepping on the brake and it's going to be convectively cooling for the, that other 900 feet until we get to the next speed limit change. Okay, so let's look at the analysis. Oops. So for the heating phase, that's when we're hitting the brake. Remember, the brake distance we've already decided is 100 feet. So to get the amount of heat generated for each one, that's just going to be the kinetic energy. Oops, I made a mistake here. It's just a typo. But the kinetic energy is going to, or the heat generated, is going to be kinetic energy 1 minus the kinetic energy at point 2. So we need to know our velocity, initial velocity, and our final velocity. And that's going to be equal to, and then that quantity is going to be equal to the amount of heat generated in the pad, Q sub P, plus the amount of heat generated in the disk, Q sub D. Okay, now Q sub P is just going to be equal to, remember that there's two pads per disk, so Q sub P is going to be equal to two mass of the pad times the uh, C sub P of the pad, heat capacity of the pad, times the change in temperature of the pad. So initially the pad will be at, you know, T infinity, the in temperature of the air, let's just say. And so that's the first time you apply the brake. And then T sub P2 is the temperature of the pad after. And then you follow the same analysis for the disk. And obviously the disk has a different mass and different uh, heat capacity properties because it's going to be made out of a different material. Okay. Now what we need to determine is how much of that heat is going to go to the pad and how much of it's going to go to the brakes. Or the disk, rather. And so to do that, we're going to look at a quick thermal circuit. And so QT is the total amount of heat that's generated based on the change in kinetic energy. And that's going to go through, uh, you know, it basically has three resistances that it can choose to go through. Um, one to each of the pads, the K sub P's there, which is the thermal conductivity, and the uh, thermal diffusivity or sorry, the thermal conductivity of the disk here. And so we get a expression here just from our uh, basic thermal circuit on the amount of heat that we can expect to go to the pad versus how much is going to go to the disk. And so with those relationships, we have two equations right here, Q sub P, Q sub D, with two unknowns, uh, the temperature at 2 of the pad and temperature of 2 at the disk. I should have done that in another color. So two equations, two unknowns, so we can march forward in time and solve these repeatedly and get the amount of heat or the temperature change of each component. Now for the cooling phase, uh, this is going to be while you're coasting that 900 feet and the change in temperature is going to be equal to this expression here, which is given in your book uh, by Shigley. And here we have the temperature as a function of time minus the ambient temperature, all divided by the initial temperature. So as soon as you let off the brake, uh, that's going to be T1 minus T infinity is equal to the exponential of your heat transfer coefficient, HCR, times the area over which you're uh, convecting your heat away over the weight of your material times C sub P. Now this H sub CR is an interesting quantity and it comes from your book. So I'm going to pull that up really quick. And so if you go to page Oops, I lost it. I 
think it's 859 in your book. There it is. Yep. You get this graph here. HCR Hmm. Okay, so HCR is a function of your radiative heat transfer coefficient and your uh, convective heat transfer coefficient. How do I try the other pen? Well, anyway, so we're going to use these graphs here to determine the uh, your total heat transfer coefficient. And as you can see, HR and HC are both a function of your temperature rise. So you need to be keeping track of that. Um, and then you can read off the HC and the HR values off this graph. OK? So going back to our original analysis, So now we have everything. We have, we're have we reading HCR from that graph that we have. We know the material properties of both the disk and the pads. And we know the amount of heat that's being generated every time we apply the brakes. And we know the starting, the beginning and ending velocities because we have the uh, expressions, or just because we know the speed limits here. So we do all that, and we can plot it. And we have that here. So this is at the first application of the brakes, the second, third, fourth, and then we come to a stop at uh, time equals or at uh, time equals roughly 160 seconds. In the red here, that's the temperature of each pad. And in blue, we have the temperature of the disk. So we can see the disk is much more massive and is, has higher resistance to changing its temperature. And so it doesn't change a whole lot. And obviously, it decreases more because there's more surface area for it to convect heat away. But the pads are still well within their tolerance of uh, temperature change because they'll go up to you know 750 degrees Fahrenheit without much trouble. So we can see that by doing this stepping uh, speed change, it takes us 160 seconds to come to a stop, but our temperature change is only about 500, or rather, our temperature change is only about 400 degrees. However, if we were to go from 65 to zero, shown here in the purple, then we can see all of a sudden we spike by 500 degrees in about, you know, that looks like about five seconds. So that's not, uh, that's not any fun for your brakes. You don't want to continually do that. And you can see that this is going to take a very long time to come down to appropriate temperature. So while we may be annoyed as heck that uh, the speed is changing so much, you know, our brakes are actually you know, thanking the good people of Waldo. Anyway, that's, uh, that's all I have today for a brake design or a brake heating. Hope this was helpful. And uh, thank you for watching.